Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. If you will, would you stand to your feet? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. And um, I'm going to get down on my knees. And let's go before God and let's ask him to be the teacher. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we're grateful that today we can boldly approach the throne of grace and ask that the teacher of the church, not a man, not a woman, but the teacher of the church, Lord, be in the Holy Spirit, come and teach us, build us, edify us, strengthen us, encourage us, and guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts this day. We receive it as good ground, The word of God is the seed. Our hearts is good ground. Going to produce great products of you, goodness of you, uh, through a lost and dying world. Father, we ask that you bless all the people in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, who are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. All those other churches that are out there, we love them. We bless them. We ask that you minister to them as well as minister to us. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Jesus, mighty name of the great big shout, we all say, Amen. Take your Bible, go with me if you will, into Hebrews, the ninth chapter, to continue the study of the Word of God. Let me just bring you up to date. As you go to the ninth chapter, you remember last time we were together, Pastor Luke brought a wonderful message called The Significance of Sacrifice. There is a significance in sacrifice, and the sacrifice that was being brought and talked about really is a sacrifice, got to get this, got to get this, about you. This is really all about, sometimes you look at this Bible and you think about it being so thick and all the stories that are in it, very thin pages written on both sides, small letters. Oh my goodness sakes alive, we say it's all about God, but you know what? It's just not all about God. It's really all about what God does for you and what God wants from you. This is really all about you. Not about where you're at, but where God wants to take you and what God wants to do in your life. So the significance of a sacrifice, as we saw in the Old Testament, was really amazing. Now let me just encourage you just for a moment. Let me have your attention. And let me encourage you just for a moment. Today, the Word of God is going to go forth from this place. It's not going forth to teach you history. That's not what we're about. You're not going to get to heaven. Whoever the greatest historian is going to get the greatest rewards. Doesn't work that way. He's going to teach you today about yourself, your heart, where you're at with God, and how important you are to God so that you can boldly approach the throne of grace, Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Because if you don't have a great image on the inside of you, about who God is, then your God remains small on the inside of you. And a lot of people that call themselves Christians have a, if I could use the term, small g God on the inside of them instead of a capitalized, bold, explanation point, God on the inside of them. And when they approach the throne of grace or make petitions to God or ask for prayers or ask God to help them, it seems like they get nothing because they're out of sync with God. God will never bless you, listen to me now, when you're out of sync with God because you'll stay out of sync with God because you'll think you're right with God because God blessed you. And we have got to come to a place where we're going to learn how to live life out, how to raise your family, how to deal with your marriage, how to deal with your boss, how to make wise investments for the future economically. We need to make uh, wise decisions for our family members, relatives, and neighbors, everything, and living life here on this planet. And we've got to live it not according to what you think, but according to what God has for you. Because when you do it God's way, you get blessed. If you don't do it God's way, then whatever the results are you get, you got for yourself. You made the determination for it. So as we look at the Word of God today, we're going to be looking at some things that are very important. May seem like a little bit of history for you, because we're going back 
thousands of years to describe you today. Can you imagine that? Let me say it again. We're going back thousands of years to describe you. This book is so intricate. Don't give me this, you know, somebody comes along and writes a plot at the end of the book. It's a great mystery. And to have two or three twists at the end of the book, you throw the book down and say, oh, man, that was great. This goes back thousands of years of integrated thoughts and heartbeat of God himself. It's so complex. But when you see the results of everything put together, it's all about you and your future. One of the things that Pastor Luke brought out to us last time when we were together was about how important the blood is. In fact, that's the title. If you're making notes this morning, the title is The Power of the Blood. Let's start, if you will, in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse number seven. I want to explain a couple of things to you. Talking about the Old Testament priesthood. Remember, keep in mind, someone says, what do I need to know about the Old Testament priesthood? I know you feel that way. But what if I told you the Old Testament priesthood speaks about you and how important you are to God today? Then you want to learn about this, don't you? Verse number seven says, but the second part of the high priest went alone once a year. So here's the Old Testament high priest going into the Holy of Holies once a year. Not every day like you get to do. Not once in a while. You know, not when there's times of trouble. Not when there's pressure. I mean, the whole thing's been opened up to you. Remember how he said it was, the the curtain was ripped, ripped from top to bottom. God ripped it open so that you and I could go in whenever we wanted to. Before, it was only once a year that the high priest could go in. Now, listen to what he said. And once a year, and not without blood. In other words, everything comes with a blood sacrifice. And how important a blood sacrifice is. Blood is yucky to us. We go, oh my goodness, there's too much blood on my plate when I eat a piece of meat. There's, you know, blood is not something that we particularly like. But the Bible tells us, remember how we learned this? In Leviticus, we found out that there is life in the blood. And a sacrifice without the blood doesn't work. So it has to be the right kind of a sacrifice that brings the life into the sacrifice. That's how important it has to be. It wasn't just a sacrifice of something that was unimportant. It was a sacrifice of that which carried life. And it was the blood that did that. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now watch this. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the the way of the holiest of all, and yet not made with manifest a tabernacle. Let's go to verse number nine. It was symbolic. Now, this talk about the Old Testament priest's activities on your behalf, watch this, is symbolic. Everybody, could you do something for me? Could you say the word symbolic? symbolic. No, one more time. Could you say the word symbolic? symbolic? What that means is it's a symbol of something that's coming in the future. So it was a physical act in the Old Testament of a spiritual condition in the New Testament. It was symbolic. It says this, it was symbolic for the present time, and was present time, talk about now, in which the gifts and sacrifice are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service, Old Testament priest, cannot make him, what couldn't it make him? Cannot make him perfect in regard to the what's the word i didn't hear you what's the word in other words it couldn't make him perfect the sacrifice that he offered way back then because it didn't clean up man's thinking follow me it couldn't clean up the inside of man It could work the flesh for a season of time, cover us with uh, the blood of bulls and goats and animals for one year period of time for the flesh, but it couldn't get down and wash the inside. Let me give you an illustration of that so you can understand it a little bit better. For an example, if I had a pig and I took it home and I took it to the backyard, I got hot water and soap, and I just cleaned that pig up. I shaved him, I cleaned him, I got his little hooves, you know, and I polished his hooves. I opened up his s- nozzle and I cleaned out his snows. And, uh, ew, mm. and then I, I opened his mouth and I cleaned his teeth and I got him all cleaned up. I mean, he's immaculate. Here's this 
just totally outside perfect pig. The moment I let the pig loose, he still thinks of himself as a pig. And he's still going to run back to the mud. Are you following me? So what happened here is the Old Testament priest could get us satisfied on the outside in relationship with God physically in the flesh, but couldn't handle the inside and couldn't handle the thinking of humanity. Are you following me? And just like the pig, we sometimes have a relationship with God, but we keep running back to the mud. As long as you run back to the mud, you cut off your own blessings. So the more you know about who you are in Christ Jesus, listen to me, listen to me, and you stop seeing yourself as the pig who did all the horrible things in the past and start seeing yourself as a child of God, then you can, verse number four of the Hebrews, boldly approach the throne of grace because I'm not approaching in my own power. I'm not approaching in my own cleanliness. I'm, I'm approaching it in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now I can make my petitions known. And if it's in the will of God, it will be granted. Somebody say amen. So here is this high priest. He could perform these services, but he couldn't perfect the inside of man. Verse number 11 comes along. Jump down the page, verse number 11. And Christ came a high priest of good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not with this creation. In other words, God himself made this one. Some cool things happen. It's not a man-made thing. It's a God thing. Big difference between... Now, I'm talking about you not just being a man-made thing. You've got to stop seeing yourself that way. You've got to start seeing yourself as a God thing. Now, verse 12 comes along. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own women. Not with the blood of bulls and calves, but with his own. But with his own blood. With his own blood. With his own blood. With his own blood. All of a sudden, something's changing here. Not with the blood of bulls and goats that could wash and clean up the outside of a man for a certain period of time, but couldn't get down on the inside. Now watch this. But with his own blood, he entered into the most high place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers sprinkled the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. In other words, if the blood did that for that temporary physical fleshly thing, then how, verse 14, much more. Come on. Come on. Wait a minute. You don't understand, Pastor. I'm a loser. You don't understand, Pastor. I'm a failure. My mom and dad never helped me. My mom and dad were two drunken people and didn't care. I've never had a break in life. I don't have an education. I'm not talented. I'm not gifted. In fact, more people have told me I'm stupid. I'll never make it in life. But I want you to hear what the Word of God has to say today. It says this. He says, how much more? Who threw the... Listen to these next two words. Eternal spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. So, it's the blood working with the... Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. The blood working with the spirit that gets and changes the inside of us. And he says, the blood and the what? Spirit... So listen, does everybody hear me now? Because it's very important you get this because we're going to come back to this in a moment. It's the blood and the Holy Spirit working together. What for? Offered himself without spot to God. Cleanses your what? That inner work in you and who you are and what you think about yourself and what you see and how you perceive things. Your conscience from those things that were of the devil, listen to this, to serve a living God. So all of a sudden we find this amazing thing happening about you. Thousands of years ago by the Old Testament. Thousands of years ago they're running through ceremonies probably 
saying to themselves, I wonder why we have to do it like this. Well, I wonder what this means. I, 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 they, this is the way it's brought to me. This is the way it was brought to me, but I don't even know. I'll just do it. And it was all done thousands of years ago so that you can be cleanse your conscience that, that old way. So you're no longer a pig. Everybody was a pig say, that was me. Oh, the whole church said it, said it, said it, should have said that one. He said, listen, all right, but cleanse our conscience from dead works. What for? So that we can now do the word. Doing the word gets us blessed. So somebody comes along and says, well, how come some Christians get blessed, others don't? Ah, they know who they are in Christ Jesus. Everybody else is still in the big state. Now, I'm using that as an illustration. I'm not calling people pigs. I'm just using that as a metaphor. If you don't know what metaphor is, I don't either. <laughs> Today, I want to talk to you about something very important, the power of the blood. Three things. There's many, many things. I could have gone for three weeks, but I'm going to give you three. You need to know, why do you need to know about this? Because... In knowing, your God goes from a little G God to a big G God. You get that? And then all of a sudden, instead of you being pushed around by every demon in hell and every failure you've ever had in the past, you no longer think about the stuff in the past that ruled your life. You think about what God's done in the future that takes you where you need to be. So what the blood has done is very important. Number one, it clean, excuse me, number one, it redeems. What I mean by that is that redeeming is a funny little word. It means it brought back to its original owner. You can't redeem something unless you had something. And God is in the business of redeeming what he used to have, mankind. And so, listen to me, and when you redeem something, that means there's a price to be paid. We couldn't pay the price. We didn't have the ability to pay the price. We couldn't, we didn't have the wealth, we didn't have the money. So God had to pay a price for you to redeem you back into his family. Take you out of being a pig and bringing you to the son of God. To bring you back into the relationship of you being a child of God. Powerful. I love what the word of God says in first, uh, Ephesians verse chapter, verse number 7. Also it says the same thing in Colossians 1.14. But it says it like this. In him we have redemption. God redeemed us. How? Through the blood. And forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now I've got to share something about Redemption that you'll understand. But let me explain it to you now. I want you to listen because I'm going to go back into the Old Testament, but I'm not going to take you there. I'm just going to talk about it. Is that okay? You might as well mark your Bible because I'm going to go there later on. Leviticus. Leviticus 25, if you want to read this, it's verse 25 to 28. There is a law of redemption. Even way back then, God knew he would have to redeem you and I. And so he had the Old Testament saints operating, if you will, in an activity that told us today what he has done for us because he loves us even thousands of years ago so that we can have this big G God when we boldly approach the throne of grace. So in the Old Testament, there's this law of redemption which most people don't know anything about. Here's what it means. When a man loses something and can't afford it and he lost it. The law of redemption says that a relative can come in and buy it up from him. He's lost it. He's bankrupt. He couldn't do it. That's just like you and I. We've lost our relationship with God. We're bankrupt. They couldn't do it. But a relative could come in, if you will, and buy up that and hold it for us. 
If the relative, and if he didn't have any relatives and he just lost everything, then anyone could come in and buy that property, whether it be real estate or whether it be something personal, whether it could be anything. If, it, if he couldn't afford to keep it, then anybody could come in and buy that property. Here's what's interesting about it. But that property that was once owned by that guy can never be returned to that guy unless the law of redemption kicks in. The law of redemption says that after 50 years, every 50 years, it's called the, the year of Jubilee, that in the 50th year, everything of the possession of the people returned back to the original owner. Oh my goodness. So this law, if you will, of redemption, this year of jubilee takes place. And that's what is so cool about this is that here we are. We could not redeem ourselves. Here comes Jesus. He pays the price and redeems us. In other words, if I can say it like this, Jesus is your personal year of jubilee. And that's why the Bible says, listen to this, that as the, there's rejoicing going on in heaven when one person gets saved with God. And the reason for it is that person's year of jubilee. Wow. And God was in the redemption business speaking about the redemption and the laws of redemption and God by his blood has redeemed us. How amazing is that? The second thing I want to share with you about the power, if you will, of the blood is that it not only redeems us, but it cleanses us. First thing he's got to do in order to do anything with you and I is he's got to get us back. That's where redemption comes in. You got to get you back. For an example, if I had a 57 Chevy and I was going to restore it, but it's in somebody's garage down in Orange County. I can't restore that at all until I get it back. I got to get it out of Orange County. I got to bring it up here. And then I got to start the process. And it starts after redemption of the 57 Chevy. Starts the cleaning of the 57 Chevy to see what I've got. And God wants to clean us. Now the problem with it is you saw this with the pig. He's still on the inside was dirty. And God's been in the cleaning business all along. A lot of people don't understand that. It's fascinating, but in 1 John, if you will, the first chapter, verse number 7, listen to what the Word of God says. God wants to get a hold of you, and when he gets a hold of you, redeems you back, then a lot of people stop and don't do anything. Did you know there's a cleaning process going on? He's going to get the old life out and bring in a new life. He's going to get the old thinking out bring in a new thinking. You're new creatures, remember this, in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 says it like this. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, his Son, cleanses us from all sins. See the word all sins? Past, future, in present. All sins, over with, transgression, over with, done deal. Relationship with God is now connected. Why? He's cleansing us. We have got to know that. If we don't know that, we're like a pig running back in the mud all the time. Then we wonder why God doesn't bless us. And we don't ever come boldly before the throne of God because we're always living in our weakness instead of his strength. Does anybody listen? Now, in the Old Testament, there was a law of cleansing. Yeah, can you imagine that? The law of cleansing. It's in Leviticus, the 14th chapter, talking about lepers, leprosy. Let's talk about leprosy, but then I'll read it to you just for a moment. Leprosy was a horrible, horrible disease. We don't have that in America. But here's how bad it was. It was very contagious. The lepers are those people that had leprosy, were called lepers, and they were outside the camp of Israel. The disease was so bad that it would eat away fingers, eventually eat the flesh and bones of hands, limbs, arms, not even to the face, ears would be gone, 
eyelids would be gone, lips would be gone, their noses would be gone, and they'd be eaten away by this disease so bad that they eventually died and loved to die. And they were kept outside of the walls, uh, outside of the city, if you will, of the children of Israel. And they were, as the camp moved, they moved behind. They wouldn't get near because they were so contagious. They didn't want part of it. Every now and then, there would be, if you will, a leper who would get cleansed. In order for him to be cleansed, remember, this is all symbolic of you. We were like that leper that had this disease that was eating our flesh away and dying. And the example is the leper, but you and I were like lepers. And every now and then one would get cleansed and get healed. And he'd have to go, isn't it interesting, to the high priest. And the priest would go through a ceremony and a ritual. And at the conclusion of the ceremony and the ritual, there was a pronouncement to the children of Israel that this person is cleansed. Let's take a look at this, if you will, law of cleansing. So strange. Let's see what it's like because it has to do symbolically with you. The 14th chapter of Leviticus starting in verse number 14. Well, let me get there. It says these words, verse 14. The priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering. Stop right there. Notice now he's with the priest. This is the guy that's going to be cleansed. The priest takes the blood, but he doesn't take the blood from any offering. It's the trespass offering. When you and I trespassed into the things we didn't belong in, there had to be a trespass offering. In other words, for our rebellious attitude and going where we shouldn't go, doing what we shouldn't do, wasn't that all of us? There was an offering. And he took the blood. No, I should have, John, if you could, highlight the word blood from the trespass offering. Actually, I should highlight the whole thing, blood of the trespass offering. And the priest shall put it on the tip of his right ear and put it on the tip of his right thumb and put it on the tip of, watch me, look at me, look at me, on his right big toe. Can you imagine those priests in those days? They're going, we're, we're do what? <laughs> Take the blood from the trespass offering and put it on his right ear and his right thumb and his right toe? Man, that's what we're supposed to do. Let's do it. Did you know what they were doing was speaking to you thousands of years later? The blood. You see the word right up there? Almost every time you see the word right, it means God's way. On the right ear, like for an example, when the devil wanted to pluck out, if you will, the right eye of all of Israel in order for him to say, the enemies of Israel said, I'll come to you, I'll give you peace. Let me pluck out the right eye. And they said, finally said, no. Why the right eye, not the left eye? Here's the reason why. Because the right eye represented righteousness that people would see. And they would never be able to follow God. So the word right up there says we're, it's right way, it's God's way. He says, put it on the right ear. Do you know what that means? It symbolizes that you hear the right way. The thumb, that you do the right way. The foot, big toe, that you walk in the right way. But he didn't stop there. Notice the next verse comes along, verse number 50. And the priest shall take from some of it the oil, a log of oil, and pour into the palm of his left hand. So here he is taking oil, and he's pouring. Every time you see the word oil, it represents in the Bible what? What? Does anybody know? Holy Spirit. So now we're right back to what we just saw in the New Testament. Of, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. The blood with the Holy Spirit cleanses the inside of us. And he says these words in 
you will, in verse number 16, that in the left hand he shall sprinkle some of the water. Seven times he sprinkles the oil over the, the one who's to be cleansed. Listen to this. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is on his, and, and his left hand and shall sprinkle some of the oil on his, on his finger seven times. Verse 17, and the rest of the oil on his hand, the priest, in other words, he's putting the oil back on the finger, putting it on his ear, putting it on his foot again, because, and then the rest of the oil, the oil that's left in his hand, watch this, if you will. The rest of the oil that's in the hand, the priest shall put on some of the tip of his right ear and, on, and cleanse it on the tip of his thumb and the tip of his right foot and the blood of the trespass offering. In other words, one who's going to be cleansed. Verse 18, and the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. What the heck's that all about? I understand hearing. I understand doing. I understand walking. What, why on the head? Here's why on the head. Because he's cleaning up the conscience. And it's the blood and the oil, remember how we said that out loud together, that gets down on the inside of us and cleanses us from the inside out. We're never cleansed from the outside in. We're always cleansed from the inside out. That's why God doesn't look at what a man wears on the outside. He looks at what a man has on the inside. Is anybody listening? And there's a law here of cleansing. And it was done for you. Why? So that you would understand what took place thousands of years ago. And your God, would, you would see how much he loved you. That he prepared for you this day. So you don't have to live. I'm going to use another analogy. I'm going to use another metaphor. You don't have to live like a pig. You can live like a king's kid. Come on, somebody. The last thing the blood does. He redeems. He cleanses. And I love this one. This is one of my favorite. The last thing. The power of the blood. He justifies. Justifies means this. That in the high courts of heaven, when the devil comes and says, you're no good, you're a bum, you're a loser, you did it again, you did it again, he did it last week too, and why would you want to bless him? Why would you want to bless him? The high courts of heaven, the gavel has come down and innocence, boom, is pronounced over you. And that's what justified me. The blood says this. It's not what you do. It's what he's done. And the gavel comes down as innocent for you. Of the high courts of heaven. That pronounce. Now for most of us here. We live in sin consciousness. We remember what we were. What we did. How we lived how shameful we were, how stupid we've been, how bad decisions we make. We remember how life was, and we're still the pig running back to the, to, the, to the mud. Instead of realizing that God's redeemed us, God's cleansed us, and now we can go on as king's kids, boldly make, because the gavel came down, and all the rest is gone. And guess what? You're pronounced innocent. Wait. It doesn't stop there. We could clap there. That would be great for a shout, but it's more than that. You're not pronounced just innocent. You're so innocent that you're removed from the crime scene. You were never there in the mind's eye of God. Wait a minute. You got to get this. If you go out and rob a store, or let's just say you were in a store and uh, the store was robbed and you knew the guy that was robbed at the store. You actually didn't do the robbery, but you were there. And the courts found you innocent, let you go. You'd always have this thing on the inside that says, you know, if they run through those tapes and they catch my DNA 10 years from now, realizing that maybe they could take me back and I'm really not innocent. They could retry me. I could be guilty again. Always had that feeling. In this case, the feeling's gone.
because you've been removed from the store robbery. You weren't even on the scene. You weren't even there. So all the stuff that holds you back, your education, your looks, your color, your parents, your economic conditions, your political persuasions, your family tree, the neighborhood you came from, all that stuff that holds you back shouldn't hold you back because you've been removed from the crime scene and that's what justification means. Oh. Now, in, a fee, in Romans, let me just pop this up, the fifth chapter, verse eight, says these words. But God demonstrated his own love towards us, hasn't he? Not just in Jesus, but thousands of years before. That's the bizarre thing about this. He so saw you that he was preparing your heart today, even thousands of years ago, so you could see how important you are. Why? Because he redeemed you. Why? Because the price God pays for you is the value you have. I've said that to you before. You've got to get this. He pays the highest price he could. Not gold, silver, precious stones. Not some universe. Not some galaxy for you. He paid the price of you for by himself. He took a part of himself and paid the price. You are the most valuable commodity on the planet. And God loves you because of your value. And God saw you today. And those people then were preparing you to be wise today. You do not have to be a pig that runs back to the mud. You can be a child of God that boldly approaches the throne of grace. And his love towards you is seen in the price that he paid. And the price he paid was with the precious blood of the innocence of his son. Man, you are valuable. I don't care what your mama said. I don't care what your papa said. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what your boss says. I don't care what the sergeant of the army says. I don't care what the school teachers say. I don't care what your cousins say. To God, you are the most valuable commodity on the planet. Wake up! Verse 9 comes along talking about being justified. Much more than having now, now, not someday, but now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. There's one last verse I got to go to. I just got to take you there. Psalms 103, I'm going to pop it up for you. Listen to this. Here, here it is. Watch this. Watch this. As far as the east is from the west. Now, wait a minute. Have you ever stopped and thought about how far the east is from the west? Well, if I, he had said, listen to how wise God is and how cool he is. Watch this. If he had said, as far as the north from the south, I can take you to the North Pole. And I can take you to the South Pole. You know that. But did you know I cannot take you to where east and west begins and stops? It just... As far as the east from the west. There's no beginning. There's no ending. As we're removed from the crime scene. The gavel of heaven has come down and pronounced us innocent. He has redeemed us back into his family. And by the power of the blood and the Holy Spirit, he's cleansing us. And all the sins of the past and the future, and even that which I screw up today. Anybody been a day screw up? Don't raise your hand. Given. So far has he removed our trans, you're not even there from us. My friends, 
I don't know what your background is. I don't know what you think in your conscience day by day. My Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. Now, here's the point. If all things are possible to him that believes, how big do you believe? Watch this. And the more you know about him and what he has done for you, the bigger he gets and the more you fulfill and accomplish. It's as simple as that. And today, you can stay home on weekends if you want. Do the video thing, you know. I think I'll stay home, just go live cast. And the cat jumps on your lap and the dogs bug you and you walk out and get something to eat in the middle of the message. Oh, I did my church thing. Or you can get in and get this. Because when you get this, your future is unlimited with Christ. Come on, somebody. You ought to give the Lord a great big praise. I'm finished. Isn't that good? Woo! <laughs> I want to make sure all of you are all right with God before you go, and then I'll let you go. I'm going to ask each and every one of you to stay put. Nobody get up. Nobody leave. Everything I just preached to you, Everything I just talked about, the sacrifices, the blood, the cleansing, the redemption, the justification, the removal from the crime scene, none of which works for you. It isn't going to work. Nope. You're going to die, and somebody needs to love you enough and respect you enough and be honest with you enough to stop playing games. You're going to die, and you're going to go to hell. It's the way it is. Unless you turn this around by becoming what God wants you to become, born again. Born again isn't knowing who God is in your head. We all know you know who Jesus is. Born again isn't just saying, well, I believe he was raised from the dead in your head and going on and serving the devil. Born again is not about what you have in your head. Born again is what you've done with your heart. And that's where we miss this. Let me share this with you from the bottom of my heart. You cannot think your way positive thinking into heaven. You cannot say to yourself, well, I hope I go to heaven and hope your way into heaven. Or I'm a pretty good person, I'll get to heaven. In order for you to get to heaven, you must be born again. And that's the breakdown. Most people don't know what born again means, but it means giving God all of your heart. It means giving God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. Is that all right? I'll make a statement like that. It's a bold statement, blunt as can be. But I love you enough to stop playing church and tell you the truth. And here's the statement, the blunt statement as it is. And the blood statement is this. In order for you to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven God's way. Not your way, not my way, not some well-meaning church committee's way. Give me a break. God speaks exactly how to get to heaven. He says you must be born again, and there's no compromise about that. And it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been, and I'm telling you the truth, and I'll prove it to you. The scripture in Revelation, last book of the Bible, says, I'm coming again, Jesus is speaking. You know he is. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That's what he just said. I'll vomit you from my mouth. Who's he vomiting? People that are lukewarm. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out, little up, little down, token prayer. You're not against God. No, no, you wouldn't be here if you were against God. But you're not wholehearted for God. That's the difference. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And he'll never become something until you make him everything. And the way you make him everything is giving him all of your heart, giving him all of your life. And that's the difference between some people who call themselves Christians and some people who are real Christians. But today is your day of salvation. To do what? Think about it. To do something wonderful. 
giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. That's a wonderful thing. And today, you can do that in this safe, friendly place. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. You sit there like this when you know you need to get your hand up and expect someday to stand before God and he will deny you. His word, he has to keep it. He may not want to, but he has to. Today is your day of salvation. You not only listened good, you not only heard something good, you not only saw how much God loves you, the price he paid for you, and how thousands and thousands of years before he planned for this day for you, this is your day of salvation. Don't miss it because you're afraid of what people think instead of what God sees. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down. That simple. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is, I don't want God in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and I don't want to go to hell. He says, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. That's a promise from Jesus. Today is your day of salvation. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, if I have to raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment in this safe, friendly place than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. Now I'm blunt, but some of you know you need that. You need someone to stop playing games with you and someone to tell you like it is. You want me to run up and down the aisles blowing smoke and throwing water all over you? Won't do a thing. You can have the whole bowl dumped on your head. Still go to hell. Because it's not about what's on your head. It's about what's in your heart. And that's what the blood is all about. Today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. You get your hand up all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at. Both, both family rooms are packed out, even in the foyer by television. Down there at Love Rock Cafe, I'm talking to you. That place is packed last week. I know you're filled down there right now. And I know there's people, you've been shoving that old burrito and that hamburger in your mouth. Put it down. I'm talking to you right now. And get ready to put your hand up and get saved. God is in the house, even in the restaurant. I just had to do that because I'm getting hungry. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. Are you ready? Get ready to put your hand up. One, two, three. Let's see your hands. Let's see it. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Back over here. There's 11 back there. There's 12 back there. 13. Thank you. 14. Thank you. 15. Back over here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. I'm not sure I saw that many over on this side. If you add your hand up, wave at me again. I'll, I'll tell you. Thank you. 60, 70. Thank you. See, I didn't see those two. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 70. 18 right here. Thank you. 19, 20. Thank you. God bless you. 20 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 20 wise people. How many down at the Love Rock Cafe? Uh, how do I know? Put the burrito down and get over here. Here's what I want you to do. Everybody that raised your hand, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Get in the aisle, meet me in front. That's it. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you can come too. No one leave during this period of time. I want every single one of you that raised your hand to get your stuff. Get your stuff, get in the aisle, meet me in front. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Give my hand it. 
Well, thank God you guys have come. We're excited about it. Real quick, look over here to your left. This is Pastor Joel. He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff. The second thing, third thing he's going to do is introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll tell you what that means. It's somebody, listen to me, it's somebody to help you get strong in Jesus. You've probably never had anybody to help you get strong in Jesus. And I'm putting in my application in your life to be your grandpa. Yeah, you can see these pants, these are grandpa pants. And I just bought them too, man. I ain't wearing them tight pants, you know what I'm talking about? And so um, uh, I, I want to be your grandpa and I want to teach you about the Word of God because you never had uh, grandpa teach you about the Word of God. And I just love you. We're excited about your future. Let us help you develop and get strong in the things of God. Is that okay? Make a left turn, if you will, and follow Pastor Joel right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.